Okay, this lesson is on the electron transport chain from cell respiration. Now to keep my video within limits, I'm going to just do a quick overview. If you're watching this video, you can pause as you go to get all these notes. This is going to get you set up for the diagram that we're going to do together that maps out all the processes that are taking place within the actual electron transport chain. At the same time, I'm not going to read through all these. But what we will do now is we are going to get started. Now, one thing I want you guys to know where this is located, you don't need to draw this. I just want you to see what we're doing, okay? This is the outer membrane of the mitochondria. This is the inner membrane of the mitochondria. That inner membrane is also called criste. If you look at this little kind of peak of a wave right there, that's what we're going to do. We're going to focus on what starts. This is going to be our starting point. S for start, this is going to be where we're going to finish, F for finish. You're going to see how this works. We're going to really zoom in to see how this actually works. Now, I am not going to have you or I do this for this entire diagram. I'm just going to do it right here, and this will be the end of it. This is just to indicate to you that the criste is a phospholipid bilayer, but I am not gonna have you or me do that a million times over. So instead, we're just gonna continue the, the phospholipid bilayer like this. Now I'm gonna make a note, the Criste is a phospholipid bilayer. Okay, it's gonna save us a lot of time. Now, you guys do not have to use the same colors I will use, but I'm definitely going to be using a plethora of different colors. Here we go. Here's our first protein embedded in the membrane. I will name these proteins at the end of this, and after every little stop, I will write a little description of what is happening here. The first thing that is happening is we have NADH. What is NADH? It is an electron carrier. NADH is going to interact with this protein and it will get oxidized to NAD+, which means it has lost its electrons and it has lost its hydrogen. Where did the hydrogen and the electrons go? Well, there's two different outcomes here. First, let's address the hydrogen. NADH is carrying one hydrogen ion. This hydrogen ion is going to diffuse through the channel into the intermembrane space, the area beyond the criste. The electrons right here are going to begin their journey down the electron transport chain. A student last period said, oh, it's like a conga line. It is gonna be kind of like a conga line of electrons. The, those electrons from NADH had now joined into the chain and they're going to be shuttled like we did earlier from student to student to student. In this case, it's going to be from protein to protein to protein. So what's actually happening here? Let me diagram or describe what's happening for you. First off, NADH is oxidized to NAD+. Does this mean it gained electrons or lost electrons? It lost. Very good. Electrons join into the electron transport chain. Not right now, we'll go back. Hydrogen ions diffuse into the intermembrane space. And lastly, NAD plus goes back to where it came from to reload. It's gonna go back to glycolysis, it's gonna go back to the prep reaction, it's gonna go back to the Krebs cycle. All right, step one accomplished. This is gonna be stop number one, I'll put a one here. Stop number one. I will name these proteins when we're all done. Let's continue down the chain.
Here's our next protein. Stop number two. Now, what's the other electron carrier that we've been dealing with? FADH2. Here it is. When FADH2 is oxidized, it becomes FAD. Now, FADH2 has two electrons. So those two are not two electrons, excuse me, two hydrogen ions. It also is carrying two electrons. Those electrons will join the ones from NADH and continue moving down the electron transport chain. I'll give you a moment to catch up. All right, what's actually happening here? Pretty much the same thing that just happened to NADH. It's almost going to be identical. FADH2 is oxidized to FAD. The electrons join the electron transport chain. Here's the one part that's different. Hydrogen ions stay in the matrix. And FAD goes back to where it came from. To reload. Hmm? Seven. Okay, so guys, let me tell you what basically with these two steps, here's basically what you're doing. All the electrons that you have collected from the last several days from glycolysis, from the prep reaction, from the Krebs cycle are finally being delivered to the electron transport chain. That's really all that's happening here. That, I shouldn't say it's all that's happening. That's the majority of what's happening. The electrons you've been collecting are now being delivered. That's it. The other factor is the hydrogen ions are being released as well. Some are diffusing into the intermembrane space, some are staying in the matrix. Can I move on? All right. We have our next protein. That was easy. In this step. Hydrogen ions diffuse to the intermembrane space. The electrons continue down the electron transport chain. That was easy. If you're wondering where did those hydrogen, where did that hydrogen come from? It came from FAD, some of the FAD. Mm -hmm. That is step three, I'll put a three on it. All right, we're gonna to start to curl around.
Okay. This is going to be stop four. This one's going to be really easy. This is basically like a little lily pad for the electrons to continue their way down. It's a peripheral protein. It's a coenzyme. It's not a full enzyme. Oop, wrong color. So here, this protein acts as a stepping stone for electrons as they continue to the next protein. Three steps down, or four steps down, three to go. Okay. Here's our last major protein. We have hydrogen being diffused out. And the electron has ended its journey down the train. All right. Now, what was the final electron acceptor that I mentioned in the electron transport chain? Oxygen. Well, the electrons are about done with their journey. We have electrons. We have two hydrogen ions and we have half of an oxygen molecule. What do you get when you combine those three? You get H2O. The electrons join with oxygen to make water. The electrons join with oxygen to help make water. This is all inside the matrix. The electrons, this electron is going to go with really with that oxygen. It's all going to end up the same in the end. They're going to help make water. Yeah. Yeah, that was step five. Also, as you can also see, hydrogen ions diffuse out. That's happening here too. All right, we only have two more steps to go. Now, guys, there has been, over time, a wealth of hydrogen ions accumulating in the intermembrane space. Look at all this. All these hydrogens that have been pumping out. Look at your step one. Look at your step two. Look at your step five. You're pumping hydrogens out. Think back to last unit. What happens when you have a lot of something on one side of the membrane and hardly any of that same something on the other side? Diffusion, exactly. Well, 
This is going to be a, a very specific type of diffusion. These hydrogen ions are going to diffuse across this particular pump. And when they do so, do you know what's made? ATP. I will go ahead and name this protein, but before I name it, perhaps some of you may remember. What is the name of the protein that makes ATP? ATP synthase. Remember that ATP synthase is a noun, it's a thing. This is step six. We have one more to go. In this step, a high concentration of hydrogen ions exists in the intermembrane space. Um, they diffuse through an ATP synthase complex. It's a pump, it's a complex. I'll put pump in parentheses, same thing. Can any of you recall what it, now the noun for where ATP is made is called an ATP synthase. What do you actually call the verb? What's the process of making it? It is chemiosmosis. This produces ATP and that is called chemiosmosis. What form of chemiosmosis is this? Is this substrate level phosphorylation or oxidative phosphorylation? This is oxidative. You're using the power of electrons to make the energy necessary to make ATP. But Mr. Thorson, all the ATP is getting pushed back into the matrix. You're absolutely right. It is. So what do we need? What do we need to do to get it out of there? We need another pump to pump it out. So we're building up a whole bunch of ATP inside the matrix. We need to get it out of there. So here's our last stop. This ATP is going to be pumped out. This protein is just a ATP channel protein. This is the seventh and final station. And I'll write a description as to what's happening. Now, where is this ATP going? Um, it's going to go wherever you need it. It's going to go in your muscles. It's going to go in your liver. It's going to go in your cells that require energy. A lot of it being your muscles. You have a tremendous amount of mitochondria in your muscle cells because your muscles need that energy for just regular activity. So the final question would be like, all right, you made all this ATP, where does it go? It goes everywhere, anywhere that your body needs it. Your body produces enough ATP to match your body weight in a day. It's a lot of ATP, this little microscopic molecule you're telling me it can equal 150 pounds, 170 pounds, 230 pounds. Yeah, I am. It can equal that much. You burn through a lot of it. Just keep eating. Just keep breathing. And you'll be fine. All right. So let's go back and name the other proteins. And then we'll be pretty much done with this diagram. Let's go back to number one. This protein is called 
NADH hyphen Q reductase. Because it is called reductase, is it getting oxidized or reduced? Obviously, it's getting reduced. Number two is called coenzyme Q. Number three is called cytochrome reductase. Number four is called cytochrome C. And number five, the last one we didn't name, is called cytochrome oxidase. Okay. Does anybody need to go back to any par, uh, portion of the diagram? Yeah, the end. And what, we're, what we will do to finish off class today is do a final head count of everything that was made. You got it? All right, let's do a final count. Okay, glycolysis. How much ATP do we make? Two ATP. How much NADH did we make? Two NADH. Okay, this NADH is gonna go to the electron transport chain. Next step, um, prep reaction. Zero ATP, how much NADH? Two NADH. This is going to go to the electron transport chain. Third step, Krebs cycle. How much ATP was produced? Two ATP. How much NADH was produced? Six NADH. How much FADH2 was produced? Two FADH2. The FADH2 and the NADH are going to go to the electron transport chain. That's what we just did. So I'm going to map that out. All right. Now, here we go, guys. This is oxidative phosphorylation. The two NADH from glycolysis are going to produce four to six NAD, or ATP. I'll explain it when I'm done. Why is it four to six? I'll explain that when I'm done. Next, the two NADH in the prep reaction are gonna be responsible for six ATP. The six NADH from the Krebs cycle are going to be responsible for 18 ATP. And the two FADH2 from the Krebs cycle are going to be responsible for four ATP. When you total it, that makes 32 to 34 ATP. Here's why it's, there's, there is a discrepancy between 32 and 34. Look back at glycolysis. Where does glycolysis happen? In the cytoplasm. Where is the rest of cell respiration? So here's why. This NADH sometimes requires the use of ATP to actually get it into the mitochondria. Yeah, it, 
there's a charge. Some cells require energy in order to get this NADH from the cytoplasm to, into the mitochondria. So that's why there's a discrepancy between four to six. Some of your cells require energy to move it. Some of your cells don't. Now, let's go back over to the left. How many total ATP were made over here? Four. By what method was, were these four ATP produced? This was substrate level ATP synthesis or phosphorylation, we'll call it phosphorylation, same thing. And how are these 32 to 34 ATP made? Oxidative phosphorylation. All right, grand total, grand finale. You just eat sugar, you breathe oxygen. What's the total amount of ATP that you can produce? 36 to 38 ATP molecules per one glucose. So for every molecule of glucose, you can make up to 38 ATP. That's with oxygen. How much can you make without it? Two. That sucks. That's why you need to make sure you're breathing and you're eating sugar and you'll have all the energy that you need. So long as your mitochondria work right. All right.